All right, hey, everybody. Week 14. This is the last weekly lecture that we'll have for this class. So we'll cover not just the content today, but some few last minute reminders to make sure everybody's on the same page. I'm going to hopefully light a fire under you, some of you that still have outstanding work that needs to be turned in. And we'll be well on our way for graduation when I'll see y'all in about a week after you watch this video. All right, so a few housekeeping things. Final reminder, I mean, we've talked about this a lot this semester in these lectures, but the assignments for this class have been massively updated to reflect the unique conditions we faced this semester. And that means that all you've had and all you still have due for those that are still missing things is 10 weekly assignments that have questions, usually two questions, sometimes three and occasionally four. They're directly related to the readings and they're all labeled assignment one, assignment two, assignment nine. And then you have one big group project, which to be honest, a few of you still have me slightly concerned here. You've either turned in projects that weren't quite up to your standards and you've gotten back comments and suggestions from me, but you haven't yet reworked these projects and turned them back into me. And a very few of you still haven't turned the group project in at all. So if you're one of these people, it's going to be really hard to pass this class without completing that group assignment, even if you do all of the weekly questions. So send me a note, get a hold of me, uh, talk to your liaison and see if we can work out some office hours or something. But we are in the 11th hour. This is your last week to fix and finish anything that's still out there and get it into me. So one more time, y'all got this, y'all got the books, you've got all the readings and you've got all the assignments. 10 weekly assignments in one group project is what I'm looking for. Cool. And then again, in our at Sterling, our graduation, I believe, is the 16th of December, which is just over a week away. So I will see you all shortly and you'll have your certificate. I did receive some good news for y'all and for us because we're in we're in this with you just this morning, actually, that they have received approval to come into Sterling and do some sort of semester for trans, a class called Transitioning from College to Career. And that'll be next semester. I'm not sure when we'll get it up and running, but my hopes would be by February or so. So keep an eye out for that. All right, a few vocab words. Now a reminder, this article that I gave you to read this week, The Spectacle of Punishment, about Shawshank prison and movie representations. It's from me. What I handed you was a anonymized copy. It's still in the process of being published and reviewers want it without names or any identifying info, but it is me who wrote this and it should be published sometime in the next month or so. It's at the final stages. But I thought it was an interesting opportunity to look once again, at the nature of the construction of our understanding about prison and those who are there, and then also from our perspective, our shared perspective, how do you take these ideas that often are rooted in our own experience of incarceration and craft them into publishable pieces, workable scripts, articles that can go out into the world and actually be read by other people who will read them and publishers who will publish them? All right, so before all that, our good old vocabulary list. The word spectacles is big in the communication field, just as a word that means things we gawk at, things we just kind of get stuck, things that are designed to be looked at, spectacles. A paradox is more than just a riddle, as we often misunderstand it, but it actually means a situation where the solution seems to make the situation worse, or a problem that the answer to that problem actually starts the problem over. They're riddles with no solutions, or rather with solutions that reinstigate the riddle. Archetypes, as you read about this week, they're just the characters that we see over and over. We'll talk about some specifics in a minute. Stereotypes are the behaviors that we put on those characters. Now, often stereotypes don't necessarily go with archetypes. They do go together. Stereotypes make archetypal characters, right? The outlaw always does have to do the same things over and over. But stereotypes tend to be a lot bigger. And as humans, we use stereotypes to classify entire groups of people or entire areas or countries or entire situations, whereas archetypes seem to be tend to be specific. And a term that I'm coining here, new prison narratives. 
I'm using this basic term to explain the difference between where we've been for decades now, for upwards of 100 years with cinema, and where we need to go. How can we still give people the spectacle of punishment that they want, because they do, while still respecting the the uh, desires people have and the humanity of those that are being represented in these narratives. And as you read, I offer a solution. We'll end the class and the, the lecture with today, which is uh, from the podcast Within and from Ear Hustle. We'll listen to a little bit of the Within podcast, which is rooted and in, recorded in institutions in Colorado, where many of you all are at. All right, that's it. Vocab completed. So it's the last week. And there's a few things that through the semesters, this is a two semester class, we just hadn't quite had time to get to. So I wanted to do my best to include some of those things today with our lecture. One of those is the elevator trope that there's elevators in the roofs of or that there's uh, lat hatches in the roofs of elevators. Now, of course, we've talked about how these specific episodes, images, stereotypes, archetypes that we see over and over again, they're not always necessarily evil or misleading, but they do teach us things about the world when we see them over and over. And sometimes those things are true, but in the case of the, like the few examples of movies we just saw and many other we've talked about in class, often they add up to us thinking we know things about the world that turn out to be incredibly false. I've never seen a hatch in the roof of an elevator, but it plays so well with movies that it's shown up over and over and it's convinced many of us that that's just the way things are. And who really cares if it's not? It doesn't impact my life very much. So I don't really go out of my way to double check it. That's what we're really going to talk about when we get to the article today. So my article, I want to actually start with just an unpacking one more time of what might be annoying many of y'all by now, this relationship to the readings we're doing into strategic communication, because strategic communication often does feel so natural that we kind of forget we're doing it. And if we don't deliberately stay laser focused on our target and consistently trying to use the ideas and the theories we've learned throughout this year here, we forget. And we often make mistakes that are really simple to have caught along the way, as many of you are dealing with in your group projects where I'm throwing some of the same language at you. So in my project, you can see Trumbo. I clearly am writing this from the perspective of someone that's been to prison. And like our friend Trumbo a few weeks ago, I'm doing it because I know that's actually what the article's about. I know that others are doing it if I don't. Even if I do do it, they're doing it. So my goal is to combat those counter narratives that are problematic. Like Santalaya, I'm sharing my story, my story of incarceration, of progress past incarceration, of life after that, to keep my audience on board. And I'm weaving it throughout, which was actually a suggestion from reviewers that I got to strengthen my personal connection by putting myself in there a little more. 
Strauss, this is the Las Vegas Mob Museum. My antisocial history of stealing, theft, all the things that landed me in prison, it's reframed here as a license for me to talk about this stuff. I can tell you all the movies are wrong. Why? Well, because I've been there, right? So even when they're right, they're usually wrong. Horton, uh, like the comic books, spectacle-laced films pe keep people engaged. So we hardly notice when we learn something, those images and scenes we just saw a minute ago. There's so much going on that when a character looks up at the elevator or Neo jumps through the ceiling of the elevator, it just sort of goes with what's going on anyway. And we don't notice a break from reality. Godwin, I too trusted the system to do things it wasn't designed to do. And I found myself surprised and disheartened when I was in a worse place when I got out of prison than when I went in, because I didn't think that's what, the, what it was supposed to work like. Oh, and of course, as many of you are prone to still keep going back to and not weaving in the new content, which you should be doing, because Rustino agrees with our authors from this semester. Rustino did say, my target audience needs a big sell. They can still have spectacles of punishment, y'all. I'm not coming along to say we can't have fun stories and movies and mayhem and murder and scandalous, but you can also feel like good people when you walk away from these narratives if we construct them the right way. We don't have to dehumanize people in prison. And I do that again with some examples. Now, y'all have read enough of my work at this point to realize it's not just ear hustle and within and other podcasts but it's the Marshall Project and Filter Magazine, which is devoted to ending the war on drugs. These publications do the same thing. They pick our curiosity. They make us think that like something dangerous and illegal is gonna be talked about because it often is. They draw us in with the taboo, but then they humanize people while we're there. Unlike Hollywood films, which often just leave us thinking that people in prison are awful monsters, irredeemable. And of course, Paige and Parnell, the zeitgeist right now is the next stage of media production. A podcasts are everywhere and they indeed are going into prisons, as I've talked about, but we're also on the cusp of normalization going mainstream. And that's another zeitgeist, which I'm hoping with my writing and with my podcasting to use to link to people who are looking for new and updated narratives about what feels like a new cultural happening or change of thought about prisons and those who live there. Now, I want to back out all that, hold on to those, because again, my goal was to simply remind everybody that we are still talking about the exact same content we've been talking about for not one, but two semesters. And to be honest, we could do a whole nother page of stuff from the first semester of class two years ago with Foucault and Bell Hooks, all that stuff's still connected. But another class that we missed along the way because we got too busy with a lot of other stuff and this is very related to strategic communication, is this industry that sort of emerged out of nowhere in the 1980s, which is insurance advertising. Now, insurance has always been there, but insurance, as many a salesman has, have, has noted, is the most boring, unexciting product to buy. Nobody is excited about buying insurance, yet everybody has to buy insurance. So for a long time, the insurance game was simply about what percentage of the market can you get? There isn't a lot of gimmicks here. You have to do really good math. You've got to have smart people crunching the numbers to figure out how much premiums need to be so that you don't go bankrupt when you start paying out to people that have claims. And then you don't have a whole lot of space to maybe slim down the price of premiums because if you do, you go out of business. That's the only way you could compete, charge somebody a few pennies less than the competition. So this meant there wasn't much advertising. The company called Geico was actually founded as Government ins Employees Insurance Corporation. That was the name, and that was the closest they could come to a gimmick. Now, of course, you could buy Geico insurance whether you worked for the government or not, but it sort of sparked the sense of trust in the 1930s that this is Government Employees Insurance Corporation. Ah, we feel a little bit more comfortable going to the people who take care of government employees. That might not be true anymore. And this is probably why Geico seldom uses the long form government employees insurance corporation and just calls itself Geico. And indeed, as we're about to see, they've actually changed that into Gecko. They've associated themselves with a lizard that has a very similar name to sort of make us forget about the government thing because it doesn't really apply anymore anyway. 
1996, this is where it gets interesting. Warren Buffett becomes the majority shareholder of Geico Insurance. Now, he's owned stock in it for a long time, but he didn't own the whole company. And in 96, he buys it. And Warren Buffett's got a ton of money, and he starts saying to his employees, I know we have a small share of the insurance market, 2 to 3% usually at the most. It's not very much. But what can we do to grow this? And what they said was two things. Number one, we could try advertising with a mascot, to which everybody probably laughed at first. Well, again, things have changed a lot since the late 90s. But at first, this was bananas. Why? Why would we use a mascot? It's just insurance. How would he advertise insurance? Number two, here's one gimmick that Geico did have. Whereas in the 90s, most people took a long time to give you an insurance quote. They'd have to gather tons of information from you, figure out where you work, run your background check for take a couple days. Geico had managed by 1996 to be able to give you a relatively accurate quote in about eight minutes. So they ran this through the PR groups and they did some testing on audiences. And believe it or not, here's another sign of zeitgeist of the changing times. Audiences said eight minutes isn't long enough. I wouldn't trust a company that can give me a quote in eight minutes. Nowadays, clearly, we have cell phones. We expect that everything we do can be done. If you're going to run my record, it should be in two minutes and you should have a good quote. A lot has changed. But the reason the ad campaign for Geico was originally 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance with a gecko was because eight minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance sounded too awful to the audiences. So they actually increased it to 15 minutes. So this is what those first, the very first Geico commercial looked like. For those of you that have seen updated Gecko Geico commercials, you'll notice right away that the CGI, the computer generated imagery is a little fuzzy and kind of creepy and that this is a bit of a different Gecko. He's evolved over the years. This is my final plea. I am a gecko, not to be confused with Geico, which could save you hundreds on car insurance. So stop calling me. Geico, a 15-minute call could save you 15% or more on car insurance. <laughs> Big difference from where we're at now, right? So in 1995, when Buffett picks, just before Buffett picks up the majority share of Geico and takes control of the company, they have about a 2.6% share of the entire insurance market. In 1998, just three years later, they've gone up more than 50% to, or almost 50% to 3.6. But now in 2022, they have a 14% market share of the insurance company, of everybody that buys insurance across the world. It's pretty impressive. So you can see Geico's right here. They're number two, just below State Farm. And as we'll see, State Farm also has a mascot. So this starts to work. And the other insurance companies that have been laughing most likely at Geico, like they're running mascot ads, really? Don't they know what this insurance game is about? They all think now, well, crap, we want an insurance mascot too. And we wound up in a world that now looks much like this. Mike, 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 Mike. What day is it, Mike? <laughs> Leslie, guess what today is? It's hump day. Woo -woo! Ronnie, how happy are folks who save hundreds of dollars switching to Geico? I'd say happier than a camel on Wednesday. Hump day! Get happy. Yeah. Get Geico. At Farmers, we make you smarter about insurance. Because what you don't know can hurt you. What if you didn't know that boxes by the curb make you a target for thieves? Or that dog bites account for a third of all home liability claims? What if you didn't know that one in seven drivers is uninsured? <laughs> Strange forces at work? Only if you're referring to gravity. And we covered it. Talk to farmers. We know a thing or two because we've seen a thing or two. Weeks. You're good. <laughs> thing or two about. I'm here in your home having a pretty spectacular Tuesday. But I don't notice the loose rug at the top of your stairs. And that's about to become an issue for me. If you've got the wrong home insurance coverage, 
my medical bills could get expensive. There you go. I can do whatever you want, except keep your eyes on the road. <laughs> now would be a good time to have new car replacement. I'm a wild deer. I'm Dryer Lynn. I'm your dog. I'm a hot babe out jogging. I'm not making sure this stays a 10 when you drive by. You're checking out my awesome headband when. Just leaving your voicemail. My number is 618-437-7425. Okay. It's for Can anyone cat. tell me what Julie did wrong there? You got to repeat the number. I mean, no one's ever going to get it the first time. Nope. Didn't leave her last name. No, the, the phone tells you who called. Yeah, she didn't mention a good time to call her back. How am I supposed to know when to call her back? No, she just sh shouldn't have left a voicemail. Nine out of ten times a text will do. Progressive. Okay, snacks and popcorn are going to be expensive. Let's just accept that. Going to the movies can be a lot for young homeowners turning into their parents. Bathrooms. Even if you don't have to go, you should try. We all know where the bathroom is and how to use it, okay? You know, the Stevensons told me they save money bundling their boat insurance with Progressive. No one knows who those people are. It can be painful. Hand me your coats. There's an extra seat right here. No, 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 no. We don't need a coat wrangler. Progressive can't save you from becoming your parents, but we can save you money when you bundle home auto and more with us. No one who made the movies here. You see, son, with a little elbow grease, you can do just about anything. Thanks, Dad. That's right, Robert. And it's never too early to learn you could save with America's number one motorcycle insurer. That's right, Jamie. But it's not just about savings. It's about the friends we make along the way. We gotta tell people that Liberty Mutual customizes car insurance, so you only pay for what you need. And we gotta do it fast. Ah. Woo! 34 miles per hour! New personal record, Lemu! Ah. He'll be back. Only pay for what you need. Tell me the Jimmy Changa! Name the device. A telephone. Turns out moms are always right. And it turns out that General is a quality insurance company that's been saving people money for nearly 60 years. For a great low rate and nearly 60 years of quality coverage, go with the General. Mike, 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 Mike. Nice work. Never heard you scream like that before. What? Dad, it's not a big deal. I'm scared of spiders, too. I know it's not a big deal. Because I didn't scream. Oh, I see. You didn't scream. No. So, that's why it's not a big deal. Should we play it back? Do it. This What Really Happened replay is brought to you by Progressive. One thing no one would challenge, protecting your home and auto with Progressive. I'm sorry you had to relive that. So you can see that a big part of the game is comedy. It's getting people engaged with a story, even if it's a laughable story or a story that's kind of over the top, and then keeping us engaged by selling the story, not the product, because you can't sell insurance. Like we said, it's a boring product. Nobody wants to buy it. And the only way you can really sell it is with a discount. They're not talking about discounts in most of these. They're talking about something entirely unrelated to any notion of insurance. It's just funny. It's engaging. It's a limu running through the woods. It makes no sense sometimes. This is the new era of advertising. And of course, it all came from the gecko actually working and catching on and Geico beginning to increase its market share after that ad campaign. Now, we're going to do this class again in two years with a different group of new students coming through. And my guess is at that point, we'll be able to supplement this discussion with gambling commercials. Because right now, the new age of celebrity endorsement and big spectacle commercials that don't seem to really even make sense is when you see Barry Sanders playing pickleball and Jamie Foxx calls him on the phone and asks him for his weekly gambling picks for football games and Barry Sanders essentially doesn't really hear him and is talking to someone else and Jamie Foxx makes a bunch of dumb bets based on Barry Sanders having a separate conversation and somehow instead of being a bit horrified like this guy's got a gambling problem we see that and we laugh and we think about him joining, or joining the website ourselves so this isn't over I think the insurance companies will become the first chapter of a new era of advertising possibly products you can't sell 
All right, which brings us to, let me bring my screen back on, the spectacle of punishment. So again, this is my article. It's, it's, so we talk about strategic communication. There's two things here. Number one, it's a summary or a shortened version of the book that's getting ready to come out in a couple months here. But because of that, number two, it's advertisement. And I've honed this on the same target audience that I'm hoping is interested in the book. People who are somewhat academic, they're interested in pop culture, in media, in prison, in drugs, in criminality, in criminal justice, and they don't really want to have to read a book by somebody who maybe talks in that academic language that even to me tends to be too much sometimes, and I have a PhD. They want something that's in the middle, somebody that can talk to them. So that was my goal with this, and both pieces are laser focused on that target audience. Now the bonus is when you write a journal journal article, you get peer review. So I had three experts in the field who all read this piece and gave me all sorts of tips to make it better, which I now can apply to my book for free. Yay! So here's what I'm claiming: every prison story you've ever heard in your life. Every book, every narrative, every story your friend told you, every movie, every TV show, they include two main characters that often will look different, but if you really look close, you can find a lot of similarities. Those two characters are the archetypal outlaw and the archetypal lawman. Now, the two you're looking at right now are from the Les Miserables movie that was released in 2012. It's Jean Valjean on the left and uh javert police inspector javert on the right but we also know them from other movies like say shawshank redemption andy dufresne our outlaw and the warden who hires him as a dirty accountant clint eastwood and alcatraz versus the warden and alcatraz who not only leaves him prone to all sorts of abuse and won't help him when he needs help, but refuses to even acknowledge that the incarcerated people escaped when they find evidence of them on the beach. Cool Hand Luke in 1967 and the warden that beats him and then quips, what we've got here is failure to communicate. Uh, the Green Mile, another Stephen King story, where, which producer Frank Darabont, same guy that did the Shawshank Redemption, crafted an outlaw versus lawman narrative. Dead Man Walking, which you read about a little bit this week. Blood In, Blood Out, I'm going way back in time, right? But Blood In, Blood Out does this fantastic job of starting two characters on the same path. And they both get involved in a crime where somebody, if I remember right, is shot in a rival gang. And one of them takes the offer for redemption and eventually becomes a police officer, whereas the other becomes a recidivist, gets caught up in the, the world of crime in, in uh, the gangs in prison and at some point in the movie the cop the out the lawman who used to be an outlaw has to arrest his old friend so they actually build that into the middle of the narrative and it's not immune to comedy we've seen uh, comedic images of it that often are the most extreme so what do we got we've got outlaws the person in this or persons in the story although it's usually one main outlaw who want redemption but faces large systematic, not systemic, same general thing, but systematic obstacles to their success. They can't just say, I want to change my ways and have people accept them. They've really got to work hard for it. We've got lawmen who don't want the outlaws to get their redemption. They're often represented by the system at large. So you can think of like Shawshank, how sometimes it's the warden, sometimes it's a CEO who's beating a man in front of the others. Sometimes it's actually groups of guards who turn the other way when awful things are happening, but they reiterate this notion of not wanting the outlaw to be redeemed. And then maybe most importantly, where viewers don't notice, they get all these images of the people around the outlaw and the lawman who are almost always monsters. They don't feel bad about what they do. They drive the narrative by threatening the outlaw. They commit all sorts of crimes. They have steak and lobster in prison. The people that kind of make viewers go, ew, man, that's an awful person. And they keep us tuned in. Those are the people we see most often in prison narratives. So let's take each on its own. I understand you've read this now and we've actually talked about it before, but I thought it might be helpful to present some examples that are included in the article and then also even in addition. And then we'll watch a brief example of each. 
So in American History X, we can see Derek Vineyard, who is a neo-Nazi who almost kills somebody based on those beliefs at the beginning of the movie. He goes to prison and he's treated awfully. And it causes this change of heart where he gets out and fights against it. Uh, the Shawshank Redemption, Red, after repeatedly going to the parole board and saying, you know, I feel bad about what I did. I'll never do it again. I'm a changed man. And being denied has this breaking point where the system just totally demolishes him. And he says, I'm old, I'm not a threat anymore. I don't really care anymore anyway. Then they let him go. He earns his redemption by being ground through that system and changing. Like I said, blood in, blood out. Paco becomes a cop after being arrested. Talk about redemption. Con Air is one of my favorites with Nicolas Cage because he's almost redeemed from the start in our patriarchal culture. That movie starts with him protecting his pregnant wife from assaulters outside a bar, and he accidentally kills one because he's been to war, and you know, he's a superhero, and he goes to prison. But he's always the good guy who's sort of stuck there and wants to do the right thing. And all the way back to Jailhouse, Jailhouse Rock and Cool Hand Luke and The Dirty Dozen and a host of films that we even read about where people earn their redemption. So what I want to give as an example is Conviction, the story of Carl Upchurch. Carl Upchurch was a real-life person, head of a, of a gang, who after going to prison got out and initiated, got together groups of gangs across the country to come to a peace summit in Kansas City. So when they made this movie about him, they centered that as his redemptive moment. And you'll see in this, not only that he earned his redemption by the things that he went through in prison, which changed him and made him a good person, because prison as penance says it might be hard, but it'll fix you if you work it. But also that the outlaw and the lawman still play their parts. You'll see the, the lawman in this case refused to offer redemption, even when it appears that the outlaws earned it. Why you listening up, church? Fuck the shit! Oh, oh, one oh, say it! Shake my ass! Chat! 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 Wait up, man! Did you find my grievance? You talk to the warden, man! Hey, me as corpus, motherfucker! Due process, you can't throw me in segregation for no reason! Peters! Hey, Peters! Peters, you motherfucker! Is that you, Mr. Up Church? How can I help you, sir? Yeah, man, give me some new food, man. I'm supposed to live on that shit. Give me some new food, food. I tell you, you won't be joining us for supper tonight. You know what else, man? Give me some new to read, goddammit. This shit is old. Sports? I told you to try the fucking comics. I think we'll hold off on the magazines a while. Anything else? Fuck you! Fuck all of y'all! Shit, man. Being locked down to segregation. I couldn't even get into a good fight, except with words, which kept the guy next to me sane, but drove me crazy. Fuck! Fuck! Morning, Martha. Everything all right? Yeah, just passing by. Everybody okay here? Yeah, we're great. Uh, yeah. Carl Upchurch, I'd like you to meet Sheriff Stark. Morning, Sheriff. Upchurch, yeah. I heard about you. You related to the boys? Which boys? <laughs> Carl's helping out on the farm. That's nice. So if you've seen his record. I know everything I need to know, Jim. Do you? Do you know how many calls we've gotten since he got here? We have had two calls from his parole officer. We've got another call from Philadelphia PD, for God's sakes. Just checking in. Brother, could you tell me how to set up a press conference? A gang summit? An urban peace and justice summit in Kansas City. 
Gang leaders from all over America will be invited to participate. These are the people influencing our communities, expressing themselves with the language of the forgotten poor. Violence. We can keep ignoring and jailing them, or we can listen. All right, so you get this image not only of the fact that prison is this penance, this awful place that'll beat you, you'll you'll be stuck in a hole, it's so brutal, but if you can survive it, if you can get through it, you'll come out the better for it. And in the middle of it, you will still have an outlaw who is in the position to possibly better themselves if they can just put up with the, the penance they have to face. And then a lawman who refuses to offer that redemption at every step of the way, often even after the outlaw indeed does do something redeeming, like have a peace summit in Kansas City. All right, archetypal prisons as a playground. This is the what I call the bread and butter of movie producers with prison films. You always get to see an image of prison as a playground, as a place where some people can get away with all sorts of evil shit and never get in trouble for it. And in fact, sometimes the guards even endorse it. And when we watch that, as I read about in this article and in the book, you come to accept that prisons are such easygoing, awful, non-punitive places that you can't help but feel like, I wish they would just crack down on those guys. And by the way, when they get out, I don't want them living in my community. These are awful people. That's the end result of prison as a playground narratives. So in comedy films like Let's Go to Prison or I Love You, Philip Morris, you see this in Toilet Wine, sexual assaults being commonplace but laughed at. Uh, there's actually a scene in, a, in Let's Go to Prison where a, an incarcerated person stabbed in the leg with a fork, a metal fork, which don't exist in prison. Then he pulls the fork out and he eats his meal with the fork and just kind of laughs at the guy. Those are representations of, as, of prison as a playground for these monsters that would get stabbed with a fork and not even be bothered by it. I think it's kind of funny, right? That's the image you get in these. Of course, in Shawshank, Red can get you anything, and he proves that this is actually true. In Breaking Bad, we do indeed see these mass murders set up, and Breaking Bad isn't even a prison-based show, and yet they still play with these same stereotypes and tropes. One of the old Cheech and Chong movies is I pick up in the book. I don't talk about this in the article, but in the book, in the longer description, they are arrested and sent to a court where it's got drunk judges and attorneys that don't care and guards that don't pay attention. These are images that we get as viewers that we chuckle at and we see prison as kind of a laughable place. We can you know, have some fun while we watch it, but we also can't help to come to feel like it should be harsher. We've got to tighten the rules on these guys. They're just going to be worse if they stay in places like this. And as an example of that, let's look at Prison Break. It's a real estate fish. Belongs to Teabag. Who? You best speak with respect, fish. Man kidnapped half a dozen boys and girls down in Bama, raped and killed them. Wasn't always in that order either. Does Teabag have a real name? That is my real name. You've seen the blueprints. Better than that. I've got them on me. Supposed to be seeing something here. Look closer.
So in Prison Break, which was on, I think the show ran for three or four years and then it had a hiatus and it came back again and they went even harder because they put them in a prison overseas, which meant they could really crank up the terrible behavior. But it's it's a nonstop on the verge of a riot all the time. Nobody is locked down. They at one point dig a, a tunnel, not only in the walls like you saw of their own cells and in the wall of the basement, but in the whole, the floor of the officer break room. And they just cover it up with a plaque and the COs never notice. It is thing after thing. And it's a nonstop roller coaster ride of images that anybody that's been to prison is like, you couldn't do that. And even if you wanted to do that, it wouldn't fly with the COs or the other incarcerated people. People in prison don't look up to people that are portrayed the way Teabag was portrayed in that scene. And yet when we watch these films, even if, even if we've been to prison, but especially if we haven't, or we don't know people who have, or we don't have real stories, we come to accept in some way that there are indeed a lot of people in prison like that. And more importantly, the other outlaws, the guy that sits down and says, you best so, show some respect, Fish. He did these awful things to people, and that means he's the man here. That's the image that viewers walk away from primetime prison drama with, in that we can't help as humans but think like, that is not the sort of place that I want anybody getting out of and coming to live in my neighborhood, and they need to crack down on those rules because it is too easy going in there. We're giving them too much money and too much freedom. That's the end result of prison as a playground. All right, prison as a paradox. Now we talked about what paradoxes are. Yes, it's a confusing situation. Yes, it's a riddle with no answer. But more importantly, a paradox is a situation that only seems solvable by something that's gonna make the original situation worse. It's almost a, a head scratcher like, well, wait, if that's the only thing we can do right now, but it's gonna make us worse than when we started, how does that solve the problem? And yet it seems to solve the problem. Now prisons are a space that we all have come culturally to believe we put bad guys, people who make mistakes, and they go there to get something that they need so that they can not only not hurt people in the immediate future, because presumably they're a threat to social order if we don't put them away, but more importantly, that they're also being rehabilitated, that something is happening in this space, that whether it's penance or not, even if it's awful, because who knows, we just know that the reason they go there is so that when they get out, they don't do the awful thing again. Now, what we see in prison as paradox representations is scene after scene where the way people behave, the way they're treated, we can't help but scratch our heads and say something along the lines of, how would that ever help somebody not commit more crimes when they get out? So when we see an image of an incarcerated person learning new tricks, new tools for criminality, when we see people traumatized by the system so bad that we know they now have to become victimizers themselves, like in Blood In, Blood Out, when we see uh, escape as the only option for survival, like in Shawshank Redemption or in Alcatraz with Clint Eastwood, we can't help but scratch our heads and say, how is this ever supposed to make prison or incarcerated people better and not worse? And this is in some ways good news. Because unlike the first two representations, where prison is a playground packed with steak and lobsters and anybody can kill anybody, in the first one, where prison is this awful space, bad guys go to earn their redemption. But if you do the right thing, you can get better and be a productive member of society. Those both make us think it's the incarcerated people's fault when they fail. When somebody gets out and they recidivate, it's their fault. They went to this playground and they acted up while they were in there. They went to penance, they went to prison as punishment, and they didn't do their punishment, so they're going back. But with prison as a paradox, as viewers, we have to kind of scratch our heads and say, how is the prison system not guaranteed to often make people worse? And then they go back to prison and they get worse again. This is no solution. The solution to the problem of criminality appears to make that problem worse. What are we doing here? That's the representation of prison as a paradox. And as an example of that, let's look at perhaps the most popular movie, prison movie of all time, The Shawshank Redemption. So he's telling the truth. Well, let's say for the moment this Blatch does exist. You think he just fall to his knees and cry, yes, I did it, I confess. Oh, and by the way, I had a life term to my sentence. 
You know that wouldn't matter. With Tommy's testimony, I can get a new trial. Well, that's assuming Latch is even still there. Chances are excellent he'd be released by now. Well, they'd have his last known address, names of relatives. It's a chance, isn't it? How can you be so obtuse? What? What did you call me? Obtuse? Is it deliberate? Son, you are forgetting yourself. The country club will have his old time cards, records, W-2s with his name on them. Frayne, if you want to indulge this fantasy, that's your business. Don't make it mine. This meeting is over. Sir, if I were to ever get out, I would never mention what goes on in here. I'd be just as indictable as you for laundering that money. Don't you ever mention money to me again, you sorry son of a bitch. Not in this office, not anywhere. Get in here now. I'm just trying to set your mind at ease, that's all. Sir, I, I didn't... Solitary, know. a month. Yes, sir. Hi. What's the matter with you? Get him out of here. Come on. This is my chance to get out. Don't you see that? It's my life. Don't you understand? It's my life. Get him out. Get him out. All right, so again, you see these narratives that run throughout of an outlaw who is really trying to find redemption by any means they can find, and the lawman who seems dead set on refusing to offer it no matter what. And in this case, with the paradox representation, you get a prison space that's designed to make incarcerated people worse. I mean, Andy Dufresne is there, and now the system has an opportunity to do what we would think it would do, make sure there's not an innocent person in here because it discredits you if you're locking up innocence, and instead it turns the other way and uses him to commit future additional crimes. They have incorporated him into a new system of criminality where he actually cooks the books and packs the warden's pockets with uh, embezzled money. That's the end result of prison as a paradox. We can't help but watch that and scratch our heads and say, how is this ever going to redeem or rehabilitate Andy Dufresne? It, it won't. He's going to have to escape to ever get out of this place, which is exactly what happens in the Shawshank Redemption. So my solution, and uh, I've actually just reworked this section. I got some good advice from my reviewers. I say we can't get rid of the spectacle because you can't, much like the conversations we've had about drugs, you can't tell to just tell people to stop using something that they aren't going to stop using, that they've made clear they won't stop using. We've been trying for a hundred years in the United States to lock people up or kill them, literally, until they stop using drugs and they won't stop using drugs. So we can just accept that there's nothing you can do to make people stop using drugs. You should do what you can to make the scenario as safe and as humanizing as possible. Now we're in a similar situation with prison narratives. You can't just tell people stop watching horror movies. We just need to stop watching movies with, crimp, with prisons in them because we love that stuff. So people will continue to find it one way or another. And if we shut down the middle productions, like say Shawshank Redemption, we can be relatively sure that people will lean on the, the more extreme productions of prison. So I suggest something different. I don't think we should destroy the spectacle. I just think we need to update it. And as I said earlier, and as you read about, I lean into this new era, this new world of podcasting and of uh, what we might call new media, different formats and different organizations that publish things that in the past might not have made it out there. And of course, I end with a call to what Mike Nellis called convict criminologists, people who were locked up in the United States who have firsthand experience like all of us and as such, we're much better suited to give descriptions about what's going on in prison, how we can fix it, what the real issues are, etc. So that is my goal with this project. So I want to end not just the lesson about representations of prisons and this call to reorient those representations to humanize those of us that go to prison, I want to actually dive in and end that this lesson and end the class with some words from the podcast within which were on an episode that aired uh, i think it was actually really early this year or late last year that's related to the project we do with captured words free thoughts with poetry and this is really powerful so my hope is that this sparks in some of you this desire to maybe go out and polish up the projects you're working on and get your voices out there Thank you.
So Denise, that's the layout. So let's hop into it and take a stroll with Travis as he gives a monologue and poetically guides us through the territory of what has helped shape his world. Starting with keeping guns in a diaper bag. Rejected us mentally, they're affecting us. No plans of accepting incarcerated the best of us. Scheming and planning, and now they're plotting on the rest of us. Societies like tell me this if I do not speak, what is my voice? And if I keep quiet, what would I be saying? Objectively, how one should respond to these questions really depends on exactly what I know. For example, I know that my name is Travis Rashad Barnes. And at one point in my life, what I knew led me to carry guns in my daughter's diaper bag. December 25th, 1979, I was born in Denver, Colorado, St. Joseph's Hospital. Like most cities, we, the people of Denver, flow through its veins. Its life is in our living, its breath is in our breathing, its blood is in our veins. When we're in motion, the city moves, and when we sleep, the city waits. It waits to embrace us. From those from the city of Denver, all the way down to the northeast side, to Park Hill, to the suburbs of Montbello and Aurora, the fragrance of the city is unique. And my generation is all that is left of a world that once was. We inherited the streets and buildings that have held and hid the struggles and tears of those who have gone before us. Like a generational curse, economic disparity has been passed down like a torch by our predecessors. And we've merely taken our place beneath the whip of a merciless master called hunger and various trials in a land wherein there seemed to be only one law, and that law survived. I lived everywhere from the Arapaho projects to a rundown apartment complex on 29th in California. I've stayed on 23rd and Humboldt to 22nd and Race, 30th and Olive Street to 34th and Franklin. Then when my dad's hustling paid off, we moved up. But when he went to prison, yeah, we moved back down. You know what, speaking of my dad, let me tell y'all something about him. More than anyone else, who I thought he was, that was actually the person who raised me. The weight of him, his cool, his gold, his heat, his cold, his guns, like living next to the sun instead of raising me, it was more like he lowered me down. Yeah, he brought me down to his kind of up, you feel me? Higher, beneath the waves of a love that was unlovely, weed smoke in the air, the clanging of dominoes, gray flannel cologne and Old Spice, the flash of a pistol. Jewelry, women, cars, tough words, tough love, made a tough kid, my father's son. Papa's face held out the reflection of perfection, flawless under the inspection of the child, prostrate at the altar of the idol he called dad. I wasn't born, I was built, fashioned, designed, forged even in a furnace of affliction by a beautiful kind of ugly, the right kind of wrong, indeed the best dad in the world. By the time my first child was born, I had been baptized and ordained as a minister of my inherited madness, though. My education came at the cost of great pain and suffering, and most of it was not mine. Like a dream, we just don't live these lives we witness them. Yet like dreams, it's hard to understand, let alone explain what it is that we have seen or what it is that we're looking at. You see, where I'm from, both the secrets of scary people and the kindness of monsters permeate the environment. A child witnessing the horrors of drug addictions, gang violence, and domestic abuse, an adolescent bearing the weight of poverty in the form of dirty clothes, secondhand shoes, and drug dealer ambitions. This world seemed like the streets only led you right back to where you started. Sure, you can turn on your television, and you can see there is another world out there, but is it real? When all you've ever seen it from was in your living room and you wish for it 
but you don't know how to get to it. And in between now and then, get your wipes, get your bottles, your toys, your pampers, your towels, and oh yeah, you better grab that pistol, homie, and put all of this in your daughter's diaper bag, because this is how you keep her safe, Travis. This is how you and her are going to make it back home, God willing. For so long, though we shared a planet, I felt as if we didn't live in the same world. At least not the same world of those who didn't share our learned experience. I now understand that such is not the case. While it is true that the economic woes I experienced growing up are very commonplace amongst a certain demographic of people. Yet, as a people, opportunity is represented by every person we encounter. And like so many others who've triumphed over the oppressive forces that have left so many shackled to poverty and dependency, we too possess the capacity to overcome the dishonorable inclination to assume a victim stance while cultivating a resolve to educate ourselves with the practical knowledge by which we may avail ourselves of those said opportunities whenever they are presented. I sure hope you track it with me. Indeed, I had guns in my daughter's diaper bag at night, but I did get up to go to work in the morning. I started as a dishwasher at a deli. I moved up to being the baker, made it out front to the sandwich block, and from there I was promoted to assistant manager. All the while, my boss never knew that I had a gun in my bag in my locker because that's what I thought I needed to make it home at night. Now you tell me, was I wrong? I've been shot at driving down the street on my way home. I've been shot at with somebody hiding in the bushes as I was on my way home. And I've been shot at by rivals, you know, while in the midst of doing things I had no business to be doing. Was I wrong? Indeed, there's a difference between an excuse and an explanation. But explanations do not excuse disease thinking. Yes, <laughs> we were all wrong. But that's all right. You can have eyes that see and still be blind in this world where insight is really better than eyesight. So personally, in Jesus' name, I know that we can lay hold of a change of mind that issues in a change of conduct. That's a transformation I myself have experienced. I know that we can look our fears in the face and acknowledge that we are vulnerable and embrace the fragility of our humanity. I know that we can love our neighbors and do unto others as we would have them do unto us. While at the same time we can step back and survey the land and ask ourselves, what have we done? I mean, really, look at the world, man. What does it say about our planet when we have dads that don't feel safe without a gun in their baby's diaper bag? I was raised in the slums, the gutter, where bread and butter was the wish blowing out birthday candles, changing my child. I think I'll just leave it with that, Joe. I'll see you a couple weeks at graduation, and I look forward to working with y'all in the future on projects you're working with, so keep me in your box.